Welcome to China Perspectives, a podcast on economic and credit developments in China, featuring experts from within and outside of Fitch Ratings. My name is Yang Wang, head of APAC Energy and Utilities at Fitch Ratings. In today's podcast, I'm going to have a fireside chat with my co-host Jeremy Zook, who is the lead analyst of China's sovereign rating on China's 2024 credit outlook. Jeremy will share his views on the macroeconomic growth outlook, implications on a sovereign rating, and key credit risks in the financial institution sector. While I'll walk you through the key credit trends in major corporate sectors and local government debt risk. Jeremy, shall we start with a macro view from you on the broader Chinese economy in 2024? Thanks, Yin. Uh, on the macro front, we think policymakers in China、uh, will have to navigate another year of difficult domestic and external economic headwinds. We currently forecast GDP growth to slow to 4.6 percent in 2024. Last year, the economy grew 5.2 percent, but this was off of a relatively low base in 2022, and quarterly momentum、uh, was somewhat subdued due to, to challenges, particularly from the property sector and external demand.、Uh, so we expect these drivers of weak momentum to persist into 2024. External demand is likely to remain sluggish, with only a very modest recovery in exports expected, as we forecast global growth to to slow a bit further this year. On the domestic side, headwinds are a bit more pronounced. The property sector will see some further downside, which will have spillovers to the construction sector and consumer confidence. Consumer confidence, in, in particular, has been dented by the fall in property prices, which has driven a, a large negative wealth effect for households, as a large share of their、uh, household savings are invested in property. And so, this weak confidence, combined with subdued income growth and potential deflationary risks, does pose a, a bit of a challenge for the private consumption outlook, which has already been、uh, a bit disappointing. Investment, though, outside of residential construction, does seem to be relatively resilient, and we do think that will help support growth this year.、Uh, but at the end of the day, the key supporting factor for the growth outlook this year is step up in policy support in our baseline forecasts. But before I turn to discussing our thoughts on the prospective policy response,、uh, Ying, I thought it would be helpful if you could give us a bit more insight on how we view the challenges in the property sector. Since this is such a central part of China's economy and outlook, yeah, I mean, no doubt the property sector is still subject to high uncertainty, and we maintain our negative credit outlook on the sector. In 2024, we expect the year-on-year decline of new home sales to be slightly narrower than last year, at zero to negative five percent. This is underpinned by our assumption that new home sales in Tier One and strong Tier Two cities will gradually bottom out and recover modestly, while the housing markets in lower tier cities could remain in a prolonged downturn.、Um, nevertheless, we haven't seen strong signals of stabilization or recovery in Tier One or strong Tier Two cities yet. The secondary market home prices are still declining, though the average rate of decline seems to be. Relatively modest. Therefore, I think there could still be downside risk to our base case expectation, and we may revisit our forecast after the first quarter sales data become available. And even if the housing market achieves some form of stabilization or recovery this year, we expect property developers to continue to focus on project completion rather than on land purchases. Um, therefore, property-related investments will continue to decline on a year-on-year basis and drag down China's overall fixed asset investment growth in 2024. Jeremy, could you speak more about our expectation for how we expect policymakers to respond to some of these economic challenges? Well, we think fiscal policy, in particular,、uh, will play a larger role than we had previously expected,、uh, with monetary policy playing a, a somewhat smaller supporting role. We think monetary easing will be quite modest this year. The PBOC did just announce that、uh, they will cut the reserve requirement ratio by 50 basis points, and we still forecast a 15 basis point cut to key policy rates, even as the PBOC kept. Those rates unchanged earlier this month. 
But overall, we think that monetary easing uh, provides somewhat limited support to both the property sector and the broader economy in the current environment, as the challenges seem to stem from a weak demand for credit rather than over the availability or price of that credit. So fiscal policy is likely to play a key role in supporting growth this year. In the first half of last year, we saw fiscal policy was relatively tight as local government spending fell. That spending by local governments was stepped up towards the end of 2023 through the use of uh, special bond quotas. And then uh, quite significantly, the central government issued a one trillion CNY sovereign bond uh, in the fourth quarter and are transferring the proceeds of that bond to local governments through the first quarter of this year. Going off of that, you know, we think these trends will continue. Uh, We do see the central government playing a larger role in fiscal policy support. We do think that there could be further sovereign bond issuances and local governments who have typically financed much of the infrastructure stimulus in the past Uh, will continue to use their special bond quotas, but because they uh, remain relatively revenue constrained, that will bring about a bigger role uh, for the central government, we believe. All of that said, you know, we still think the government wants to use policy support to limit downside risks to growth rather than giving it a sharp boost. So this means that while we expect fiscal support to play an active role this year, We don't really foresee a huge fiscal stimulus. Um, Our estimate of the augmented fiscal deficit is around 5.5% of GDP this year, similar to last, but there are some downside risks to that forecast, and certainly that forecast is higher than what we expected during our rating review last year. So, Ying, I want to turn back to you, and with this fiscal outlook, how does this feed into our view of uh, infrastructure investment? We expect infrastructure investment growth to remain relatively resilient. As you mentioned, it, it is still a key policy tool to, to support growth. Um, we observed a trend last year that among different types of infrastructure projects, the conventional ones such as roads, bridges, water service, environmental services, and public uh, municipal services underperformed the growth of investments in power utilities and railway. And the main reason was because the conventional projects are mostly invested by local governments, while the central government-owned entities take up a higher share of investments in power utilities and railway projects. The local government's investment capacity was impeded by their tight finances. Therefore, the central government and its affiliated state-owned entities' role in driving infrastructure investments seem to be bigger than they used to be, as you mentioned earlier. Um, And I think financial institutions could also be more willing to lend to central SOE-led projects. So, you know, touching on the point that you just made about the central government providing more funding on behalf of the local governments to invest in infrastructure, I wonder if we can talk about how you look at this from a sovereign rating perspective. Yeah, certainly. So we we last affirmed the sovereign rating at single A plus with a stable outlook in August of 2023, but we are seeing growing downside pressure on the sovereign rating due to uh, some of the economic and public finance challenges that we've just discussed. Increased fiscal support in the near term uh, will add to some of the recent deterioration of public finance metrics that we've seen over the past several years at a time where we still see the risk of contingent liabilities materializing on the sovereign balance sheet have increased quite a bit. So from a sovereign rating perspective, we actually look at the general government fiscal balances and and debt, which includes both central and local government debt. Already in the past several years, as I mentioned, we've seen a rise in deficits and debt driven primarily by local governments. So China's general government debt ratio jumped from below 40% of GDP back in 2019 to around 55% of GDP by the end of 2023. And so this means that uh, it's gone from below, well below the single A median to now just above the single A median. 
indicating that China now has somewhat less fiscal headroom from a ratings perspective. So sustained uh, high deficits then to support growth this year and perhaps in coming years will add to some upward pressure on the debt ratio. And in terms of our forecasts, we think going forward, central government, uh, where explicit debt is still quite low, will be a bigger driver of some of that debt accumulation in, in our forecasts. And touching on the contingent liability side, uh, so risks there we think have risen, particularly in LGFEs. We've already seen the issuance of refinancing bonds in select provinces, and, and that's bringing some of this LGFE debt directly onto local government balance sheets. And we think we're likely to see a continued gradual migration of uh, some of these contingent liabilities onto the sovereign balance sheet over time. And sort of the outstanding stock of uh, potential contingent liabilities is likely to remain large for the foreseeable future as, you know, some of the issues in the LGFE sector and local government finances have yet to be fully tackled. Indeed. Speaking of the LGFE sector, we have a neutral outlook this year versus negative outlook last year. This improvement is reflecting some degree of stabilization of local government's fiscal revenue with a modest recovery in operating revenue offsetting a probably small further drop in capital revenue, both from a lower base in 2023. This coupled with steady growth in government bonds should support a slight resumption in fiscal expenditures benefiting LGFEs. However, we think this recovery of fiscal expenditures will be quite uneven. The economically weaker regions may face further deterioration in fiscal revenue and tighten expenditure. And we expect LGFVs to operate in a mixed policy environment, supporting financing of existing debt yet limiting new debt growth. More debt being issued by the local governments and the central government to finance LGFV debt and fund local expenditures helps to alleviate short-term liquidity pressure of some local governments and LGFVs, but the policy support uh, may not be sufficient to fully remove any isolated risk of LGFV default. And as you mentioned, I would agree that there's not yet a sustainable long-term solution to fundamentally tackle the local government debt risk. Local governments will still need to rely on LGFVs to raise funds and to support a significant share of expenditures. And their finances are not going to recover to the pre-2022 levels in the foreseeable future, given a sharp reduction of land sales. We think the central government's tight control on new hidden debt and LGFV debt is necessary to contain the overall public infrastructure debt growth. But if the restrictive policies lack flexibility, and result in abrupt tightening of liquidity. There could still be isolated credit events. Yeah, it's quite clear from your comments that LGFEs remain in a difficult position. But how do we see risks in other corporate sectors? Most of our rated corporate sectors will face largely stable operational and business conditions despite moderating demand growth. Upstream commodity companies have been benefiting from strong prices in the last two years due to supportive demand, supply constraints, and geopolitical risks. While we expect commodity prices to moderate in 2024, they should still remain supportive for commodity producers' cash flow generation. The steel and cement sectors will see further consolidation as stricter environmental regulations drive out smaller, less efficient producers. The engineering and construction companies will continue to see polarization with the central SOEs strengthening their market positions. Utilities will have relatively stable credit profiles. The moderating fuel prices um, should potentially improve the power generators and distributors' profit margins. We expect defaults from the Chinese corporate issuers Um, publicly issued debt to stay quite modest in 2024. This is in line with the trend uh, that we have seen from the last two years from the corporate sectors except property. This is 
partly due to China's monetary policy easing, which leads to quite ample funding market liquidity at falling interest rates. Um, and also has to do with the strong performance of issuers from the upstream sectors, as well as an increasing share of industry leaders and SOEs among the domestic corporate bond issuers. If we look at the net issuance volume of domestic corporate bonds in 2022 and 2023, it has been on a declining trend. Actually, the net issuance volume in 2023 was negative. Um, and this reflected broadly soft investment appetite by corporate issuers and a shift towards indirect bank financing. And speaking of bank financing, we have seen that the Chinese banking sector has borne the brunt of China's slowing demand growth and turbulence in the property sector. It is also a major party to Chinese LGFB's debt revamp program. So Jeremy, perhaps can you share our credit outlook on the Chinese banking sector, particularly if there are any implications from a banking sector credit risk on the sovereign rating? Certainly. So for China's banking sector, we have a deteriorating outlook for the sector in 2024. This primarily reflects persistent revenue pressures that is coming from tepid retail demand, uh, as well as sustained pressures on net interest margins. And those net interest margins are expected to remain pretty thin despite some likely reductions to deposit rates and the planned reduction uh, to the triple R that we already discussed. So profitability is another challenge for the sector, and this is a result of government directives to support growth, uh, loan repricing, and uh, some of the lingering weakness that we've seen in the property sector and LGFEs. Impaired loans are likely to rise uh, just a bit given the modest pace of the economic recovery and a tighter impairment recognition from new asset classification rules. Overall, we think credit growth will be relatively modest in 2024, uh, kind of in the lowest double-digit levels uh, at some of the larger banks that fetch rates. The impact of the property sector uh, in particular on Fitch rated banks has been uh, somewhat muted, and this is because exposures to property developers are somewhat limited, and there have been uh, you know, active impaired loan resolutions over the past few years. However, you know, if some of the signs of property stress persist beyond next year, uh, that could challenge some of the sector's resilience. And so far, I think most of the property-related stress has been concentrated a lot among you know, the, the asset management companies rather than in the formal banking sector. The restructuring of LGFE loans that, that you talked about, Ying, are also likely to impact uh, banks' profitability in the near term. But our base case largely is that we won't see a large-scale LGFE loan restructuring or a deployment of ultra-long LGFE loans within a short period of time, given the authority's interest in maintaining uh, stability among the banking sector. So in terms of the uh, impact on the sovereign rating, we don't see much of a, a large impact, especially in the near term. Economic challenges are not being influenced really by constrained supply of credit, but it's a story of reduced demand for credit. And you know, beyond that, the overall system remains relatively resilient, particularly among uh, the Fitch rated banks. And, and we don't really see the need for large scale sovereign support to the sector, although we have seen a few small local banks that have run into trouble. Before we conclude today's podcast, how about each of us share three things to watch out for from a credit perspective in 2024? From a corporate perspective, I am most keen on the pace of recovery in the property sector, for sure, um, and also the pace of consumer confidence recovery and LGFB's refinancing risk. How about from your side, Jeremy? Yeah, from the sovereign side, we'll be most closely monitoring the really the form and the magnitude of the policy response this year, uh, contingent liability risks. And, uh, and then what do these recent trends, including some of the deflationary pressures, 
what does that imply for the medium term uh, debt trajectory? Thanks, Jeremy. Based on what we just discussed, I suppose uncertainty will remain a keyword in 2024. And it seems that risk is skewed to the downside with regard to our base case forecasts. China is continuing to face high uncertainty and a number of threats and challenges. And the structural challenges and imbalances are likely to persist. So let's track how the economy performs in the coming quarters. And I look forward to explore more in-depth analysis, the economic development and credit developments in China in this year's podcast with you. You have been listening to Fitch Ratings China Perspectives podcast. To learn more about our ratings and research on China, visit us at FitchRatings.com. Please subscribe to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Take care until next time.